name is Sarah Sundquist. I'm the Shasta Safe Routes to School Program Coordinator. And I thank you for attending our Building Connections Conference today, organized by Healthy Shasta and Safe Routes to School. This conference today is, uh, is part of our Safe Routes to School program and is funded by Caltrans. And we also appreciate the support today from Shasta Living Streets, who will be, um, Ann Thomas will be coming up here later to speak, and the California Convergence. They're the ones taking your photos probably in the lobby. Um, so now I just want to call on Amy Pendergast to say a few words. Hello, I'm Amy from Healthy Shasta, and I'm really excited to see all of you here. And we have a lot of great speakers coming up. A few housekeeping items. There will be food during the breaks in the lobby. There's the table topics, and you can pick the topic you want to talk about and mingle at that table and talk with others. And um, there's restrooms and things in the lobby as well. And I'm just going to go ahead and turn this over to Francie Sullivan to welcome everyone here. She is the current mayor for the city of Reading and has always been very supportive of bicycling and active community environments. Thank you. Thank you all for coming, and you'll all be relieved to know they do have a timekeeper down here who's going to cut me off. Um, our theme today is making connections, and it's all about collaboration. And I want to start by saying thank you to safe, rate, safe Routes to School. When it's safe for kids to get to school, it's a lot safer for the rest of us. Healthy Shasta, Shasta Living Streets, and Caltrans. And that first connection I'd like to be between your right hand and your left hand and join me in thanking them. Um, so obviously, again, our, our effort today is to talk about collaboration to create great communities. Some of the other things that will happen, you all know, but later on at 5, there will be table topics. Uh, pick, pick your uh, topic of greatest concern, have a little snack, and chat with other people. Um, tonight, you are all invited as free guests. Is that true? Did I read that right? As free guests. Actually, as guests of the members of Shasta Living Streets. And that's really why I wore my t-shirt. I always forget it says Rob on the front, but we love Rob it too. Um, but uh, tonight, we're having a members party for Shasta Living Streets at Old City Hall from 6.30 to 9.30. And anyone who is here today is invited to come as a, as a guest. So it'll be a great party. More food, more music, and a great way to end the evening talking some more to other people who uh, like to walk and ride bikes. Um, and tomorrow, I think they're I saw this a while ago up here, but speaking of the trail, there's going to be tours of the trail uh, with Terry Hansen, who is, you know, uh, where is, is Terry here? He usually frowns if you say nice things about him when he's around where he can see you, but Terry deserves a lot of credit for the rest, for giving, providing bike trails for the rest of us. There's going to be a walking tour with Terry, uh, bike tours, a pop-up playborhood, I love that word, and a Sundial Bridge tour. So we hope all of you can, uh, can stay for that. Uh, we ordered this weather uh, especially for this weekend. And um, I think it says much about the attitude out in the cosmos for people who want to walk and ride bikes, that we got a day like this to talk about it. Um, so with that, I'm moving on to the real uh, treat this morning, Brian Jones who is a professional engineer and planner at Alta Planning Plus Design um, in Oakland and headquartered in Portland, two cities that I like to walk in and, and am envious of their, um, of their livability. Um, he has expertise in creating walkable and bicycle-friendly communities, uh, background in public works, engineering in Fresno, Carlsbad, and others. I didn't say that with the right inflection. And he's a voting member of the California Traffic Control Devices, which I think um, I'm, I'm anxious to hear more about that because they are the people who have saved my life a few times when I was trying to get across many lanes of traffic. But um, I was actually pumping him for um, what he does in other communities before the talk, but I think that's what his talk is going to be about, and he says it much better than I do. But again, thank you all for coming. I hope you'll share all this wonderful information with all the unfortunate people that couldn't spend the afternoon with us. And with that, Mr. Jones.
Perfect. Just move this just a little bit. Okay. I am honored to be up here in Reading. It was a beautiful drive up here yesterday, and I just kept looking at Mount Shasta and kept heading north on I-5, and I knew I was heading in the right direction. So, um, and last night and today, I got to drive around your beautiful city and see all the great progress that's going on in Reading, and I want to commend uh, the city of Reading and Caltrans for a lot of great projects they're doing, whether it's road diets, these pedestrian crossings right out in front of this school, a number of different solutions. And I think there's a lot of great things that are going on, and, and it's a lot of great things to build momentum off of uh, for the future as we try to build a more connected Reading and a Shasta County. So uh, with that, um, my talk today is about creating great communities through transportation. And historically, we've been doing transportation through communities. And, and if we flip it around, we can create better communities. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about how to do that and some examples of, of that and why we should be doing that. And so to start up off, I always like to start off with a little story because it's like a bedtime story, but I'm not trying to put you to sleep. Oh, and wait before. I have a basket. If you guys want to pass this around. And if you click a business card in, I have uh, a book and I have a book and some gift certificates and some trinkets and everything else to give away so you can go home feeling like a winner. So um, feel free to put your business card or put something in there um, that has your name on it. And if you need not be present to win because I can mail it to you, but um, hopefully you are present so we can all cheer and be excited for you. But once upon a time, we thought the world was flat. And it limited our mobility, and we didn't leave the shores too far, and we didn't, we didn't interact by ship very much. And then we realized the world was round. And we opened up trade centers, we found new lands, and we explored the world. Much like that, our water industry went from going from quantity of water to quality of water. And so you'll find that we do a lot of stormwater retention basins to clean the water before it goes back into the Sacramento River or the San Francisco Bay um, or to the ocean. But our transportation has been really still doing transportation through communities rather than communities through transportation. And as a result, we've been getting a lot of solutions that look like this. And I'm not sure how many lanes are up there because I lost count once I got past my fingers and toes. Um, but there's a lot of lanes up there. And this is down in San Diego. It's the 805 freeway and the 5 freeway. I-5 goes all the way down to San Diego. And um, so if you just get on I-5 and keep heading south, you'll eventually get there maybe nine or ten hours later. But at any rate, you'll get down to a roadway that looks like this, and it's so big and so wide and so vast and so noisy and so pollution, and it's not a pleasant experience to live by, travel on. And this is taken at about 10.30 in the morning, but between 6.30 and 9.30, it, it, it looks like a parking lot. So um, we design it for a parking lot, and then in the off-peak hours, everybody's going 110 miles an hour. Um, so if we change, we saw what water looks like when we went quantity to quality. What did transportation look like? And I just want you to get a visual image in your head of what could transportation look like and what is the most favorite street you've ever been on and experienced? And I'm guessing it might not be Cyprus. Um, I'm guessing it might not have been I-5. But, I mean, I-5 does have a great view when you're heading north. So, uh, um, but what street... And where do you go to experience a great street and great transportation? And I'm pretty sure going to the mall is not the best experience as a pedestrian or bicyclist. And it's really not that great of an experience for a motorist because you're going in and parking in a parking lot amongst a bunch of other cars and then you have to walk four or 500 feet to the front door. Um, and we've built a lot of those around our communities. And we, we size them for Black Friday. Uh, um, and then we ha the rest of the days, we just have black asphalt. Uh, um, but really understanding the situation is we have a lot of cars, and we have a few people in those cars. And how do we connect those people when they're not connected in their cars? And since I'm hired by the health department, I always have a slide in here, but I like this. This is in most of my slides because... At one time, I kind of looked more like that right. 
um, and I'm trying to look more like the middle. Uh, um, but why are people going and becoming to look more like the right? And I'm going to show you what their exercise looks like. It looks like this. <laughs> They're not burning a lot of calories sitting on their rear end in a car moving their ankle. Somebody said, well, they get a little core workout moving the steering wheel like this. Uh, um, but we as a society are going more and more to the right because we're designing our transportation system to facilitate this as exercise rather than walking and biking as exercise, as our daily activities. And so what I like to say is we've been protecting the fish, we've been tr protecting the plants, we've been protecting the animals, but maybe we need to start protecting ourselves. Maybe we need to start looking as pedestrians and bicyclists as the indicator species. And I say the transportation food chain, we often design our communities around that orange vehicle that's called Allied. And as I've moved around in jobs in the state, that thing moves my wife's shoes. We have another one for our clothes and another one for our furniture. And my stuff fits in the trunk of the car. Um, but at the bottom of the food chain, we're designing our streets for the orange truck, but we're losing the bottom of the food chain. Fewer and fewer kids are walking and biking to school. Their parents don't feel safe for them being on the streets. And as a result, we get a lot of congestion around our schools. And then that perpetuates more people driving because they don't want their kids run over. But as soon as they drop their kid off, they're part of the problem running over the next kid. And you'll watch it at any elementary, middle school, or high school in America. And the real issue is when we have roadways that are at 40 miles an hour, you have a huge chance of dying or a severe injury. But if we slow traffic down, which is already a parking lot in the peak hour anyways, to 20 miles per hour or 30 miles per hour, you have a greater chance of surviving a collision. And here is that image. And this image is also for economic vitality. As a motorist driving down a street at 15 miles an hour, they can see the storefronts, the pedestrians, the bicyclists. They can become customers and decide where they want to be. At 30 miles an hour, this is what they see. At 50 miles an hour, it's a pinpoint drop, and they don't see anything. They almost don't see the car in front of them. And as a result, when pedestrians and bicyclists are on that street or businesses, they have no idea what is on that street. And so I have a lot of real estate agents that call me and say, how, many traffic are on the, how much traffic is on this roadway? And I'm like, it really does, I'm going to tell you a little secret. It doesn't matter how much traffic is on the roadway, it's how fast the traffic is moving on that roadway. If it's moving more than 20 miles an hour, they're not seeing your storefront, so it doesn't matter. And if they're moving more than 20 miles an hour, they're creating an environment where your customers don't want to do window shopping in your businesses. And I say... A well-trained motorist stops at a red light, just like a cat does at the or the dogs do at the Canine Academy, right? This is how you pass as a canine uh, officer. You got to let that cat walk in front of you without attacking it. But we often ask for that pedestrian to cross 140 feet, eight-lane roadways, to get to the other side of the roadway. And we do that because we have this policy about level of service in our general plans. And we say, we put in some assumptions into the computer, and the computer tells us that your roadway needs to be 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 10, 12. Oops, it now needs to be 13. And we try to build our way out of congestion. Let me tell you, the 26 lanes down in San Diego still results in congestion. They can make that 48 lanes, and it still results in congestion you won't be able to build yourself out of congestion. So what I'm encouraging you to do is to consider first starting with designing your roadways for people and then accommodating the automobile. And when you first design for people in place, you create a much different environment for users. And when you look at it from an economic prosperity per perspective, here's the same roadway two different times of the day, off peak and on peak. One to an economist is level of service F. You're getting very little bang for your buck. And the other is a, to an economist is level of service A. You're getting a lot of bang for your buck. You're moving a lot. You're, that roadway is being well used. But here's another 
crux. The bigger, the wider the roadways, the more infrastructure and maintenance costs that we spend on it. The, f the more s speed is on the roadway. And as a result, they become less safe. And when we go back to the level of service computer model, the one on the left was built before the computer was created, and the one on the right is, is basically what the computer is telling you to do. They moved the same 9,000 cars on them. They were just built in a different era of transportation. One is five lanes and moves at 55 miles per hour. The other one is two lanes and moves at 30 to 35 miles an hour. One has a school. One has five lanes we need to maintain. We're moving them twice as fast, but they have to come to a red light just like the other one, and they don't, that really they're, how fast they go along the corridor is very indifferent because the traffic signal is the greater influence. So one thing I always like to say and at the bottom is, uh, wide roadways often disconnect people and communities from their potential. Every year we're killing 32,000 people on our roadways in America. It's a phenomenal, traumatic number and it's staggering. And incomplete streets exist and this is why people are dying. Here is a public works department and a transit agency that aren't working together because one built the sidewalk for a private development and the bus stop is still 200 feet from the end of the sidewalk. This is near a senior citizen community. Those seniors have to get out into that 50 mile, 55 mile an hour bike lane adjacent to traffic and walk 150 to 200 feet to get to that bus stop. This is their only mode of transportation because they gave up their driver's license. This bus picks up immigrant farm workers. They have to slide down that hill to get to the bus. This sidewalk has a guardrail protecting the cars from going off the cliff, but the pedestrians can't walk on the sidewalk. So let's say that lady in front of that single wide stroller, and many of us now have double wide strollers, wants to turn around and head the opposite direction, she can't pass that guy without really getting intimate with him. Maybe that's a benefit. But as a result, she has to go on the other side of that guardrail that's protecting the cars that can't stay in their travel lane. Here's a sidewalk where a bridge was made, built, and the sidewalk didn't go across the bridge. The right turn lane was more important than the sidewalk. This is also on the other side of that sidewalk that didn't quite make it to the bus stop. So the seniors are walking on this sidewalk, they have to get into this right turn lane, then cross a 100 foot intersection to get to another sidewalk, and then they have to go 150 to 200 feet in the bike lane to get to that bus stop. Pretty traumatic experience when somebody's in a walker. So a really smart guy, an innovative guy named Elon Musk, who's doing SpaceX and, and Teslas, and if you're invested in his company, you're probably pretty wealthy right now. Um, he says, we need a feedback loop. We need to continually ask, are we, are, is what we're doing the best thing? And is there any way we can do it better? And he reinvented the car. He reinvented the space shuttle. He's saving the US federal government millions of dollars on every launch. And what I say is we need a new vision. If you build cities for cars and traffic, you get more cars and traffic. If you plan for people and places, you get people and places. So how do we better move and connect people sa safely and efficiently or effectively so that communities can thrive? And that's really about building connections. Here's a street where we added some nice lights up in the trees to create the ambiance and mu bring music out onto the street. And all of a sudden, the community is gathering around this music. This is what streets can do. We changed how streets were called. Instead of calling them collectors, collecting cars, we started calling them connectors, connecting people. When you design streets to connect people, it's a very different street than if you design streets to collect cars. Here's a pleasant sidewalk where outdoor patios and dining is gonna occur. Here's a family using bike lanes, buffered bike lanes. Here's a farmer's market on the street. We brought this farmer's market onto the street so that people could experience the businesses that were on that street. It shuts down from Wednesday from 1 to 5 p.m. and everybody can buy great produce 
And they also see all the businesses that are on the street that they drive by way too fast. So livable streets is really expanding how we're looking at streets and connecting the destinations of where people are starting and where they want to be with where they're in in between. It's looking at how do we make the connections in our community. And when we do a word chart and we bring a whole bunch of people together to define livability, the biggest word comes out is connectivity. The other one is pedestrians, that's also equivalent to people. Bicyclists, that's equivalent to people. And you really don't see the big word of automobiles up there. I don't think. But when we talk about connectivity, how many of your subdivisions are connected to each other? Or do you have walls around them? Are they cul-de-sacs? Are they dead ends? Is the only way in and out of your subdivision through a four or six lane roadway? Or can you get to the school in the market through a nice grid system that like exists in this neighborhood? And when you look at economic vitality, transportation is a great indicator. So how do we provide for demand? We have to start managing it better. We have to stop providing for, for demand and, and start managing and providing choices. Choices in routes, choices in mobility, choices in destinations. We have to bring a bunch of different disciplines together. It's not just planners and engineers, it's public health, it's schools, it's advocates, it's smart growth, it's urban equity, it's economists, it's historians. And I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. This book came out in January of 2014, it's a bestseller. Every community public works director community development director, university, and mayor, and council members should have this book. The secret to great cities and towns is your street design. It's a step-by-step -step way to how to create great streets in your community. Victor Dover and John Masingale are incredible architects and planners, and both very good friends. So I give them a little plug, but it's an incredible book. I read it in one weekend. It's, $84 or something like that. Um, but what else can we be asking for our street to do for us? Because a lot of times we're just giving it more pavement and providing more capacity. But what other thresholds could we be looking at for our streets? And we have a number of other measurements that we could be looking at our streets. And really, that comes down to being the difference between of being efficient and being effective. And are we doing the right things? Not just doing things right because for a long time we've been trying to be really efficient and do, the right, do things right. And now is a good time to take a step back and identify what could we be focusing on to do, thing, to do the right things. Because when we have different goals, we get different outcomes. When we talk about performance measurements, we talk about connectivity, prosperity. You know, a lot of businesses like Amazon up in Seattle told the city of Seattle, we will move in as long as you put a cycle track which is a separated bikeway next to our facility. You have big technology companies down in the Bay Area and Los Angeles that are investing heavily in their communities, trying to get their communities to be connected to, to BART stations and Caltrain stations and shuttle systems and whatnot so that their employees have an option to get to their campuses because they can't afford to build parking garages and it's more costly to get their employees to change their behavior it's also better because their health insurance premiums go down. Because when your employee is walking or biking, they have a decrease in health premiums. But it's really about doing things different. We often do things in silos, and really it's about what can we all do as a community? How do we bring transportation, land use, economic development, parks and schools and advocates and community citizens and leaders together? And we ought, you know, most people are looking for the same thing, but what we often design for is speed. We first set up, how fast do we want this street to go? We say, oh, we want a design speed of 65 or 75 miles an hour, and so we built a street that allows them to go 65 or 75 miles an hour. Oh, wait, we allow the semi-truck to go 65 or 70 miles an hour, but your performance vehicle can go 85 or 95 miles an hour, and then you get a speeding citation for $500. We kind of induced you into speeding. 
So creating opportunities from perceived challenges. And how do we do that? In Carlsbad, we had the Carlsbad Residential Traffic Management Program. And we designed, to, uh, we first designed about enforcement and education. We did enforcement out there, we did education, and then we went to a, the, our next solution was a $300,000 solution for each residential street. And my mayor and council said, wait, 300,000 times the 30 streets on the list, that's $9 million program. We don't like that. Is there something we could do that's more cost effective? So we inserted phase two into it, which was traffic management, and we used stop signs in residential neighborhoods to calm traffic. Now, I sit on the MUTCD and it says, you should not use stop signs for traffic control. It does not say you shall not. And for $1,500 intersection, and I can kick out four or five intersections on a residential corridor for under $10,000 and improve the safety and quality of life in a residential neighborhood, that's a pretty good success story. And now I can do all 300 streets for, or all 30 streets for $300,000 rather than 30 streets for $9 million. Huge game changer for that community. Here's a crosswalk that I worked on in Fremont. Four lane roadway. Here's all the pedestrian collisions that happened at that crosswalk. They were doing involuntary cartwheels over a 40 mile an hour car putting a star on the windshield with their forehead. Pretty traumatic, and it was all caught on videotape. They forced me to watch the videotape. It was a pretty traumatic experience. It also necessitated me taking a different approach and a different look to getting something out there rather than an eight to 18 month program to find a solution. We did something in about six weeks. We knew from our theory that creating bull bouts to reduce the crossing with helped improve the safety and vulnerability of pedestrians crossing. We also knew it increased the visibility of motorists seeing those pedestrians. So we came in and we reduced the roadway from four lanes to two lanes. We closed down the left turn pocket and we created bulb outs with these planter boxes. They're $400 water filled plastic boxes. And they have flowers that grow real nice and they self water with the water inside of it. So there's almost zero maintenance on them. And a car hits one of those, it might bend their bumper, but it's gonna save a life. And it allows to narrow up and give a visual friction on the roadway. And it slowed travel speeds from 40 to 45 miles down to 25 to 30 miles an hour. It increased the yield percentage for motorists stopping for pedestrians from 15% up to about 85 to 90%. We also used rectangular rapid flashing beacons. But we realized we also had distracted pedestrians. They had their headphones in and they were reading your medical charts because they were going from one hospital to the other hospital across the street or to the BART station. They had their headphones in, they were reading a book, an iPad, your medical charts or something like that. And they were distracted pedestrians. So what do we do? We didn't force them to push the button. We just put a motion detector up there and as soon as they walked through that path, the lights all started blinking like it was a cop car, and all the cars came to a complete stop. So we didn't rely on the distracted pedestrian to do the right thing, but we told the motorist, hey, you might have a pedestrian in this corridor to be on the lookout. So we closed down this left turn pocket, we put advanced yield lines, we, we even created a new standard of a crosswalk outside the crosswalk, and we put those little um, jack-o'-lantern teeth on the outside of the crosswalk. We use the regulatory sign, yield to pedestrians here, makes it look official. And there's a car stopping at the yield line. And this is the question that I was asking. Why do we build roadways where when a mistake or a poor decision is made, whether it's a drunk driver, a distracted driver, a distracted pedestrian, why does somebody have to die? And right now, 32,000 people are doing that in our communities. Here's an, a, a, a roadway in Carlsbad. It's a five-lane corridor. My council came to me and said, Brian, we need to fix this. Somehow we need to get that surfer to the big wave safely. Because he's running across the street with a 12-foot board, or that's an eight-foot board, seven-foot board. And you see that real narrow bike lane right there, and the 30 miles was just a suggestion. So we've identified five crossing locations up there. And we said, here's what the roadway looks like today. Here's what we'll do. Here's what we did. 
the before, after, and then we, the before and the visual rendering and the after built up momentum that we could do what we delivered. Now, for engineers, this is what it looks like for us on our engineer plans. But for an elected official, this is a great way to, to sell them on a concept. Here's a roadway, hotel resort over there, 7-Eleven on the other side of the roadway. The beach down here where I'm at. I'm in the Pacific Ocean. The 7-Eleven has Slurpees. The beach does not allow alcohol. So some people put alcohol in the Slurpee and take it down to the beach. But they gotta cross that street to get to the Slurpee machine and then down to the beach, right? And you gotta go every frequently because your Slurpee goes down. So we put in a crosswalk just like that across the intersection. Because I was sitting out there one night with, with dinner with my wife and I watched over 100 people that hour cross diagonally around that intersection. And I'm like, they're going from the shortest path from curb return to curb return. And if I made them go to the other curb and that curb, they would still cross diagonally through that intersection. People do the shortest path of least resistance, and this is the person using the street now. And the thing I have to say is sometimes we focus on the process rather than the results. And during that process, more people are dying. So there's nothing that kill, low speed kills when it comes to delivering projects to improve safety. And there's a lot we need to be doing in our communities to improve safety. Here's one in front of an elementary school. It looks a lot like this middle school. And, we, and it had a really wide street like this. And really wide streets induce speeding. And the number one complaint I always got when I was a city traffic engineer is speeding on my residential streets. So we took that street in front of that elementary school and we said where that middle arrow is and we said, why don't we do that? Oh my gosh, that looks just like what you guys did out here in front of Reading, right? Or in Sequoia. But then we said, you know, that's not quite enough. We still have some issues out here. And we knew traffic signals at either end of that school we could help parents turn around. It could also help create a gateway feature at this elementary school. So we said, why don't, and we didn't have a lot of money, so we used eight inch ceramic domes for about $4,000 while we were doing a pavement project, we put in this project instead of doing a concrete traffic circle. So now people ride around it. They're just tall enough where it feels awkward to drive over them as a car. The fire trucks can go blowing right over them. A moving truck can go right over them. But now mothers and fathers dropping off their children can make a U-turn and head back the direction they came from rather than making a three-point turn in front of the elementary school and running over your kid as you're dropping them off. This roadway used to not have bike lanes, and it was only 24 or 25 feet across. And you start doing the math in your head, and you go, well, what are those travel lanes? Those are nine-foot travel lanes right there. And no, they haven't resulted in any killings of any people. Because a semi-truck can drive down a nine-foot travel lane. So can a bus. Here's this bus passing bicyclists in that bike lane. It can be done. They just do it at a slower speed. We had this curve that looks like an inside-outside, inside NASCAR curve. But before the bike lane was there, it was a 20-foot wide travel lane or 25-foot wide travel lane. And there's a high school about a quarter mile up the roadway. So you can imagine a 16-year-old trying to check out their parents' new car, see how fast they could take this S-curve through here. And they do the inside-outside, inside move. And so we put in this bike lane to further delineate